السلام عليكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد In the traditions of Ahlul Bayt we read that Rajab is a heaven is a river in heaven Nahrun fil jannah What does this mean? And how does that affect us? Water the essence of water, the meaning of water, the universal meaning of water is that which satiates you that which satiates you now that's the universal meaning it's inseparable from water but the application differs according to the realm of existence so for example in the physical realm of existence that which satiates you is this H2O that we drink and that's why we call it water because the meaning of water is that which satiates you even before this H2O existed this was the meaning well that's not, that's not technically true but but the reason why they call H2O water is because it satiates you but that's in the physical realm in the metaphysical realm whatever qualifies as satiating you that is also called water and it's water in real haqiqi terms it's not a metaphor there's no allegory so here suddenly we see that Rajab is a river in heaven now heaven is metaphysical it's in Yawmul Akhir it's in another realm it's not in this realm Yawm means manifestation the reason we call it day we call it Yawm because it manifests that which we couldn't see at night but Yawmul Akhir it means another it's another manifestation not a worldly physical manifestation so heaven is something metaphysical and therefore the river in heaven this too is metaphysical and therefore this H2O is that which satiates you in the metaphysical realm what is it? it's knowledge it's the knowledge, true knowledge Tawheed Rajab the month existed before Islam Rajab in Arabic, Ibn Arabi says that it means Samad, it was, it's the name of Allah it means Samad today when we discuss Tawheed قول, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قول who say him who is the name of Allah what the theologians call Allah the Orafo call him who the philosophers call him pure existence Say him, pure existence. Allah, it's an external name. It's a name. Ahad is one. Pure existence is one. Has no beginning, has no end. So it's, it's, this one is infinite because it has no beginning, has no end. It's infinite. Allahu Samad. Allah is Samad. Meaning, he's not, no, he's, he's empty free. Nothing is Allah free. Nothing is existence free. Nothing is empty from Allah. Nothing is empty of existence. Lam Yalid, he doesn't give birth. When a mother gives birth, the child now is independent from the mother. But with Allah, Lam Yalid. Whatever Allah manifests, 
it never becomes independent from Allah. Your mental pictures, for example, never become independent from your mind. The gloves, the shirt, the trousers, they never become independent from the thread. Anyway, this Tawheed, Rajab, is knowledge in heaven and this knowledge is pouring down in the month of Rajab. We all have access to it. It's pouring down from the metaphysical realm, but here our hearts have to be ready. If the heart's not ready, the water is gone to waste. Knowledge has gone to waste. Tawheed has gone to waste. That's why in the month of Rajab, when you look in the books of Dua, it focuses on two rituals. And one is Tawheed. Reciting Suratul Ikhlas, Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad, either a hundred times in the morning, a hundred times at night, or seventy in the morning, seventy at night, a hundred times throughout the whole month of Rajab, whenever you want, a hundred times every day, if possible, a thousand times, if you can, during the whole month, and so on and so forth. They're full of these kind of traditions. But it's all on Suratul Ikhlas. Look, it's a river in heaven. It's pouring. Divine knowledge is pouring. Divine knowledge. And that's why Rajab is also called the month of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Tawheed is being poured down. Not that Tawheed is not being poured down in other months, but we believe that every moment of time is different to another. From moment to moment, every moment has its own identity and passport details. Some parts of the year are different to other parts of the year. Each has its own effect. So, this is being poured down. Now, let's see if we're a good recipient or not. The second ritual which we see in the month of Rajab is istighfar saying astaghfirullah as much as you can although they do assign numbers a hundred times every day or a hundred times in the morning a hundred times at night and so on and so forth but seeking Allah's forgiveness because we want to enter the month of Ramadan with a clean slate and repentance is very important. Sometimes you've sinned and you say, Allah forgive me, and the sin is forgiven. Or even if you didn't repent, for most sins, you can be forgiven if you do good deeds, the hasanat. Or even crying for holy figures in Islam. May relieve you of that sin and forgive you. For example, crying for Imam Hussein alayhi salam. You committed one sin and then you cried for Imam Hussein and then that sin will be forgiven. And that's possible. Or verbally repenting for your sin to be forgiven. That's okay. But the effects of the sin won't be cleansed. That's a different story. Crying for Imam Hussein, there, no, no. This is something different now. The sin is one thing, but the effects of the sin is something else. And that's very difficult to be cleansed. That's very difficult to be cleansed. Allah is Qafar. He quantitatively forgives your sins. Allah is Ghafoor, even the quality of sins, Allah will forgive. But Allah is also Afu. That Afu is cleansing from the effects of those sins. That, that, that requires much more. Just because your repentance is accepted, 
it doesn't mean you're freed from the effects of that sin. That's a different story. That's very difficult. In the month of Ramadan, we have traditions that say that Iblis and Iblisi forces in play, his hand is tied behind his back. Because Iblis, we'll speak more about this later, but um, Iblis is a manifestation of Allah's name, Al-Mudil, the misguider. Because Allah, in Allah, yudillu ma yasha. Allah misguides those who want misguidance. That's a proper translation of the verse. If you say Allah misguides those that He wants, those that, that He wants to misguide, that's not a very accurate translation. It can be explained or interpreted or justified, but the translation, according to Arabic, uh, the rules of Arabic syntax, it's problematic. But I won't tire you with the reasoning. Allah is the misguider. Allah is the grantor of knowledge. Allah is the grantor of sustenance. Allah is the grantor of life. Allah is the grantor of death. It's only Allah. It's all Him. Kulla yawmin hu fi sha'an. But the thing is, when Allah gives knowledge, He does it through Jibra'il and Jibra'ili forces in play. In the nursery, when someone is learning something at primary school, secondary school, university, seminary schools, these are all Jibra'ili forces in play. But it's, it's Allah's knowledge manifesting through Jibra'ili forces. Wherever there's life, be it in a plant, animal, the birth of a child, these are Israfili forces in play. But only Allah is the grantor of life, period. Only Allah. But He does it through these manifestations, these intermediaries. It's all pure existence, but pure existence has a, has a, has a hierarchy. And then, wherever you see sustenance, these are Mika'ili forces in play. Wherever you see death, be it someone dying, be it the beard whitening, these are Israeli forces in play, and Israel is talking with you when your beard is whitening, for example. Wherever there's misguidance, these are Iblisi. He had a name before, because he used to be in heaven, Iblis. He was jinn, but he had such a high degree that it took him to the heavens and he was even he had a very high station there. And there, his name was Israel. Or, yes, Isra, yes, I can't, with Israel with an Ain at the end. Um, I can't remember exactly, but there was a name he had. It was an angelic name. And um, after his sin, although we'll speak about this later, because it, to understand Iblis, it's important to understand Islamic leadership. You have to understand what Iblis means. So I want to explain that another time, inshallah, maybe tomorrow or the day after. Iblis, he manifests Allah's misguidance. But Allah misguides those who want misguidance. So you did something wrong. Then satanic temptation came your way. But you did something wrong. Not that you did nothing wrong and all these satanic temptations in your mind go on sin, these came. No. You did something wrong, then you get these satanic temptations in your mind. It's cause and effect. It's cause and effect. What is it that you did wrong, which in proportion to what you did, you get the, these satanic temptations? The answer is ghaflat, forgetting Allah. To the degree you forget Allah in a 24-hour period, in proportion to that degree, you will have satanic temptations. This is an equation, cause and effect. 
not that you did nothing wrong, but you kept, keep on, yes. So, Iblis is an agent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually his ma'soom in this agency that he's been assigned by Allah, with Allah's permission. The traditions say Iblis and Iblisi forces, their hands are locked and he's incarcerated on some island and he has no access to you in the month of Ramadan. Why? What does this mean? It means in the month of Ramadan, even if you forget Allah, you will have no satanic temptations. This is one of the blessings of the month of Ramadan. Whereas before, the rule was, in proportion to how much you forget Allah in any given 24-hour period, satanic temptations come your way. In the month of Ramadan, even if you forget Allah, satanic temptations won't come your way unless you sin, a Sharia sin. That's the exception. Then everything breaks loose. But if we don't sin, he won't come. We'll have no satanic temptations. Question, why do we therefore still have all these temptations in the month of Ramadan? Because we didn't repent. We didn't enter with a clean slate. Sinning is one thing. Erasing the effects is another. That's something else. That, there's no simple guarantee. There's no abracadabra here. You have to take this very seriously. So, in the month of Rajab, and you know the month of Rajab? The first of Rajab is when Noah's Ark, Nabi Noor, it landed on Mount Judy on the first of Rajab. It's the beginning of new life. It's the beginning of, yes, you know, new in, in that case, it was surviving materialistically because only 80 people were on the ark and then now they have to start again. Also, the beginning of spiritual life. But on the 1st of Rajab, it's commonly attributed to this event. And since it's the beginning of life, be it materialistic or spiritual, in the books of du'as, we see in the books of du'as, when they go through the months, the du'as of each month, they start with the month of Rajab. They start with that. Maybe that's one reason, the start of, you know, spiritual life. Also in preparation for the month of Ramadan. But Rajab, these two rituals we see, it's very important. There are many other doors and everything. But it's based on Tawheed and Istighfar. Now this knowledge of Allah, divine knowledge, Tawheed, is pouring down. Pouring down through what? Rivers have branches, what we call tributaries. These branches, tributaries, through which rivers flow. Branches in Arabic is Shu'bah. Shu'bah. Oh, now we enter the month of Sha'ban. It comes from Shu'bah. It's the month of tributaries. Tributaries of that river. The Ahlul Bayt. The maximum manifestations of Allah's attributes. You have to get it from Ahlul Bayt, this knowledge. They are the tributaries. There's a hierarchy to pure existence. It's all cause and effect. You want to see Allah's patience, you have to see Amir al-Mu'mineen. You want to see his forgiveness, see Amir al-Mu'mineen. You want to see his revenge, see Amir al-Mu'mineen. And so on and so forth. The month of Sha'ban, month of Raja. Yeah. Anyway, the Sha'ban is the month of the tributaries. This is, goes through the Ahlul Bayt. That's why it's called the month of the Holy Messenger. That's why it's called the month of Ahlul Bayt. And that's why Salawat is recommended. When you go through the books of du'as, 
in this month of Sha'ban, there are many du'as, but the ritual of reciting a lot of salawat, it's recommended. A thousand every day, a hundred every day. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And in this salawat, this tawheed, this nubuwa, this ma'ad, this adala, and this imama. This tawheed because you say Allahumma, O oh Allah. This nubuwa you say ala Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This imamat wa ala Muhammad. There's Adala because you say Salli to Allah. Send blessings. You wouldn't say that, but if He wasn't a just Lord, He does it out of His justice. He sends blessings. Although He sends blessings to everyone. But since these are maximal manifestations of Allah's attributes, yes, we're going through these individuals and ma'ad because this salli send blessings when now when they're living or what what when they're passed away are they no longer manifestations of Allah's attributes of course they are so even in the metaphysical realm even after they die salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad because they are manifesting moment to moment when they were here here when they were but in the other realm, they're still manifesting. So, that's the month of Sha'ban. And then, it's also called the month of the Prophet. And then we come to the month of Ramadan. And in the month of Ramadan, we have Laylatul Qadr. And Whereas Laylatul Qadr was the Qur'an being revealed to the Holy Messenger, we can also receive a form of divine revelation. That Tawheed, that river in Jannah, which is pouring through the tributaries, we can be a recipient of revelation, divine revelation. We all have that capacity. We can all be a recipient of angels, get a message from them, benefit from them. Everyone to their own capacity and degree. Many of you may have even seen angels, but you didn't know it was angels, for example. But that is something which is open to everyone. And everyone can benefit on a par with their own capacity. And that's why the month of Ramadan is also called the month of the Ummah, month of the people. How much everyone to their own share of that heavenly river of Rajab. When you go through the rituals of Laylatul Qadr, you see chapters 29 and 30 of the Holy Quran are very recommended. During the month of Ramadan in general, but especially in the nights of Qadr. Chapter 29 is Surah Al-Ankabut. Chapter 30 is Surah Al-Rum. The question is why? Why is it important? Which verses are emphasized here? Which are related to gaining true knowledge from the heavenly river of Rajab and benefiting and acquiring true life, spiritual life and exiting a state of just being dead like a corpse. Which verses are there? In chapter 29 verse 64 وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاتِ 
و ما هاده الحیات و دنیا الا لحون و لعب This is in chapter 29 سورت الانکه بود That this حیات و دنیا This worldly life What is it? The Quran says it's nothing but lahu and play. Diversion and play. It's a game. Diversion means being diverted away from Allah in different forms. And game is a game where any sequence of actions that you do which is traced back to one's imagination, they call it la'ib. It's a game. Do you know when children play with toys, for example? This is mummy, this is daddy in the toys. And uh, we're playing and everything. That is a pilot and this is they're flying from here. To, you know how they play. Then the mother calls them to come and have dinner, they just throw everything, they forget everything. It was all imaginary. That's a game. This worldly life is a game. Now that, inshallah, will open that up maybe tomorrow morning. It's a diversion and it's a game. Okay, anything else? Then it continues. al الْآخِرَةَ لَهِيَ hayawan. This Worldly life that we're in, in this physical realm, this hayatid dunya, it's a diversion from Allah and it's a game. It's all takhayyul, it's all imaginary. You're dreaming, it's all a dream. Many verses of the Quran say this explicitly. That in the same way you're dreaming at night when you sleep, you're dreaming in the day also. That's Hayat al-Dunya. But Akhira, this Akhira, which is the metaphysical realm. It's a metaphysical realm. La Hiyal Hayawan. I don't want to go through the Arabic, you know, particularities, the rhetoric of this verse. But there are three or four different particles here, all emphasizing that Akhira, that is true life, and anything else, it's not life, it's you're dead in that realm. Lahiyal Hayawan Lokanu Ya'lamun. If only they if only they knew, but they don't know. If only they knew that true life, spiritual life, true life, not physical life, it's in the metaphysical realm. And we are also metaphysical creatures. We have a physical dimension, but we have a metaphysical dimension too. That is true life. But Hayat dunya it's nothing to do with true life. It's dead. If you're drowned in it, you are dead. What does it mean to be dead? It means lahu and la'ib. When you're diverted from Allah and when you're in a game. But we still haven't opened these two up yet. All we know is, if you're only confining yourself to the worldly life, you're dead. Right now you're dead. Even though that you're physically alive, Spiritually or dead. Because true life is somewhere else. It can't be found in the worldly life. Okay, can you explain what this death means, being dead, whilst living physically in this world? It means only la and la'ib. If only they knew though, the thing is they don't know. What do they know? Chapter 30, Surah al Rum, verse 7. dunya. They only know the zahir, the outer superficial dimension 
of the worldly life. That's, that's all they know. وَهُمْ عَنِ الْآخِرَةِ هُمْ غَافِلُونَ But they, in relation to Akhira, which was true life, and only Akhira is true life, in relation to Akhira, they were غَافِل They were oblivious, heedless, forgetful. That's the problem. And here we see that Akhira is a code name. It's a code for Batinan min al hayatid dunya. Because it's used in opposition to Ya'lamuna zahira min al hayatid dunya. But in relation to the Akhira, they, they don't know. They're oblivious to it. It means wherever you see Akhira, which is one third of the Quran, it's to do with the Batin of the worldly life. Yes, the Batin's important here. If you suffice with the Zahir, it's nothing but Lahu, diversion from Allah, and La'ib, a game. We still haven't opened what these two mean though. We have to go step by step here. Yes. So the question is, why are we dead? You may be a Muslim. But you're still dead. Because Islam is very easy to say, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. Even when you, if you say it verbally, with belief, but if someone else says it verbally, you have to assume they're a Muslim. When you, when you want to say it personally to yourself, I mean before becoming a Muslim, you have to believe in La ilaha illallah, that idea of pure existence. Muhammadun Rasulullah, he is a maximum manifestation, like with other prophets, he is a maximum manifestation of Allah's attributes. But you may be a Muslim and not pray. You may be a Muslim and do many sins. And therefore being a Muslim is step one. But you, most Muslims, if not all, they are still dead. You need more. You need more than Islam. What's after Step one of Islam, what do we have? Answer is step one of Iman, faith. Where the articles of faith, they enter your heart. Yeah, if it enters your heart, you're more than a Muslim now. Because belief, conviction has been acquired. Qalatil A'rab Amanna. The Arabs, the Bedouins said, we have Iman, our manna. Qul, O Prophet, tell them, Lam tu'minu. No, you don't have Iman. No, brother, you don't have Iman. I don't know the verse off my heart, but you may know, Walakin. Qulu, rather tell them to say, you, O Prophet, tell them to say, Aslamna, that we have Islam. And that's easy. But don't say, we have Iman, because for that, not even step one of Iman, because for that, Wallama yadkhulil Iman fi qulubikum. Iman hasn't entered your hearts yet. So you say Aslam now. We have Islam. We're Muslim. But don't say Aman now. When the Bedouin said Aman now, if Allah was quiet and didn't say anything, what should we assume? Because Allah is the narrator here. We assume that Allah's given the green light. Look, it's, it's in the Quran. If someone says, I have Iman, and they're not lying, um, and Allah doesn't reject their Iman, we have to accept it. Because that would be unwise of Allah, na'udhu billah. To narrate someone saying, I have Iman, and Allah not correcting it for us, and now we have the book. So how are we going to know they were lying? You see? They didn't have Iman because Tawheed didn't enter their hearts yet. 
they were still, they said La ilaha illallah, but they were scared from other than Allah too. You may be a very high scholar, a very high scholar. You may be a religious authority. You may even be a manager. It's possible. But you may be scared of other than Allah. Is it possible or not? It's possible. Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi when he was exiled to Najaf, there was a majlis. The Ba'this, the Iraqi Ba'this, who everyone was scared of, entered the majlis. Many of the scholars who became marjas later there, they all stood up for the Ba'thi soldiers. Imam Khomeini remains sitting down. Who are they? I'm not scared of anyone but Allah. What does it mean? Standing up for these criminals. He wouldn't stand up. And he was living in Iraq. They could have easily taken him away. He wasn't scared of death. He wasn't scared. One of his doctors then narrated on Iranian television when there was a time where they would always connect him with a heart machine to monitor his heart. They were very scared that you know, he may have a heart attack or different things, so they would observe him very regularly. And once, when they were bombing Tehran, the windows of the residence where Imam was residing cracked. It had reached. The bombs didn't hit the house, but it was nearby. The doctor narrated this, that when we looked on his heart ECG, it didn't change a bit at that moment. Yes, He's not scared of anything. La ilaha illallah has entered his heart. Actually, Imam Khomeini gives an example of you know, the person who does the ghusl of the corpse. He gives this example. We all know that the person is dead, but we're scared to sleep in the same room as a corpse. We all academically know that corpse is dead, but we still we won't sleep. But that person who is the ghuslater, who does the ghusl, he has iman that that corpse is really dead. He has conviction. So he will sleep with the, even with the corpse in the room. He's not scared at all. Tawheed has to be incorporated in you. Then that's level one of Iman. That's level one. But that's not enough. Because the Quran says, in one verse, it says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Chapter 8, verse 24. No, sorry, chapter 2, verse 208. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu. Those who have faith, Iman, level one, level one of Iman. You see, when you see Iman in the Quran, Allah Taba Taboi has categorized four classes of Iman. He's extrapolated them from the Quran. And four levels of Islam. Level two of Islam is higher than level one of Iman. Level two of Iman is higher than level two of Islam. Level 3 of Islam is higher than level 2 of Iman, and so on and so forth. But look at this verse, it says in chapter 2, verse 208, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, udkhulu fissilmi kafatan. O you who have Iman, enter into Islam altogether. What kind of Islam is this? It means that Iman's not enough. You have to still continue. It's not enough yet. Even when you acquire level 2 of Islam, it, it, it doesn't say, Oh, you who have Iman of level 1, get Islam level 1? That doesn't make sense. That's going backwards. This is a high level of Islam. It's level 2 of Islam. But that's not enough either. In other verses of the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu. 
Oh, you who have level one of Iman, Amenu, get Iman. Oh, you who have Iman, get Iman. It means this is another Iman. This is another Iman. This is level two of Iman. And then, that's not enough. You have to keep on going, higher and higher. Then the Qur'an says most believers, most people who have Iman, they are mushrik. Chapter 12, verse 106. Look, so look. You may be a Muslim, you may be a believer, Iman, you may be a mu'min. You may be a higher Muslim, a higher mu'min, but you're still dead. You're still dead. You still haven't acquired the true life, true tawheed, true knowledge. You're still a living corpse. Why? We said to be living truly, that's in the Dar al Akhirah. It's a metaphysical reality which has to be ingrained within you. Right now, you have to be seeing, tasting the metaphysical realities. If you're not, you're dead. Why are you dead? Because you're drowned in lahaw and la'ib. In chapter 8, verse 24, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اِسْتَجِيبُوا لِلَّهِ وَلِلْرَسُولِ إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ لِمَا يُحْيِيكُمْ So, O oh, you who have faith, you have Iman, yes, but you're still dead. And the Qur'an says most believers are dead. Answer to Allah's call. Answer to the call of the Prophet. So that Allah may grant you life. You are ayyuhal ladhina amanu. But you are dead. You have to do more, then Allah will grant you life. Look. So look, we're getting closer now. This is, there's some signs here. That the invitation to true life, even though we're mu'min, we're still dead. But there is an invitation. We have to be granted true life. Why aren't we granted true life? Because of lahu and la'ib. They are the hindrances. Because they are dead. It's only akhira, which is true life. Allah can grant you, O mu'min living in this world, who are dead, Allah can grant you this Akhira right now. The Akhira being the Batin of the world and life. We're so dunya toxicated that we are hindering ourselves and that's why we're dead. And then one verse in chapter 16, I haven't written the number but maybe it's 97. Man amela saleha, one who does righteous actions. Min dhakarin o untha, be they male or female. This means whether you're male or female, the route to spiritual perfection is equally accessible. Doubt this argument that women are naqisul iman, that, that, that's another story, it's another narrative. Many women were, their spiritual perfection was more than a lot of prophets, if not all, in relation to Lady Fatima, but most prophets in relation to Lady Maria. Alayhim salam So, yes, spiritual perfection is open to everyone. Man amila saliha, who does righteous actions? Min dhakarin o untha. Be they male or female, wahua mu'min, whilst they have iman, which level of iman is this? A question mark for now. But the result is, 
فَلْنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاتًا تَيَّبًا We will most definitively, most definitively grant them the pure life, that life which they didn't have and they were dead, we're going to give them. So this Iman is a high level of Iman. It's not the Iman where the Quran says most of the Mu'mins are Mushrik. It's not that Iman. It's not the Iman of Ya ayyuha ladina amenu udkhulu fi silm kafatan or Ya ayyuha ladina amenu amenu. No. This is a whole different ball game now. Because you're going to be granted it. But what do you have to do to be granted life? metaphysical life, the barton of the worldly dunya, to be a recipient of it in the month of Ramadan or outside the month of Ramadan. What you have to do? Man amila salaha. Really? So what are all these actions we're doing? What's the answer? It's not righteous actions. These actions that you think you're doing and you call yourself a doer of righteous actions, how can they be righteous actions when you are dead? مَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاتُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَحْوٌ وَلَعِبْ You may seem as doing, you look on the outside, it seems that you're doing righteous actions. But righteous actions, it's not a function of the zahir. It depends on your inside, whether the action, the zahiri action you're doing is a righteous action or not. And therefore this shows that in order for an action to qualify as being righteous, don't you say, I do salat, it's a righteous action. No. This is a function of the inside now. A, a monafiq does salat, a mu'min does salat, the action is the same. But in order for that to be a righteous action and for you to be granted true life you have to be laho free. You have to be laib free. And that's very difficult. And we still haven't opened it up yet. What is this lahu and laib? Now we enter the discussion of what it means that most believers are dead. The verse explicitly says it. Most believers are mushrik. Mushrik in the concealed sense. That they're using Allah as a means to something. For example, if someone sins, they are mushrik in the concealed sense. They're using Allah and all His blessings to go against Allah or to sin. But sometimes someone doesn't sin. They do good deeds. But in those good deeds, they're using Allah as a means. For example, they give charity, but they give charity because they want someone to feel better, their illness to go. They don't do it for Allah's sake alone. For example, a man says to his wife, I like you because of the cuisine you give me at night. Sometimes he says, I like you irrespective of whether you give me cuisine or not. In the first one, the woman is used as a means here, a means to cuisine. In the second one, the woman is the objective. It's the goal, the ends. You have to do things for Allah's sake. But if you give charity so that this child gets better. It's good, it's a good deed, but you're still a mushrik, you're still dead. Don't worry, you'll go to heaven. But level has, heaven has degrees. When you go to a, a, as one ustad said in Rome, it's going to be a heavenly stable. The animalistic pleasures you were looking for, you'll get it. But to be with Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Holy Prophet, these things. Concealed shirk is very difficult. There's one tradition where the Holy Messenger says, Ash-shirk fi hadhihi al-umma This shirk 
he's referring to concealed shirk that will be evident as we go through in my ummah this shirk is akhfa is more concealed min than it's more concealed than so that you can tell it's concealed shirk it's shirk khafi so to speak akhfa it's more concealed than dabi dabi bin namlat soda ala sakhrat samma fi laylat dalma it's more concealed than what than the movement of a black ant on a rigid rock where it's not it's not you know plain it's rigid it has you know it's it's, it's more difficult to see someone moving when it's rigid not rigid rigid so to speak on a dark night a black ant on a dark night you can't see anyway let alone its movement let alone on such a rock on such a stone so this means we are drowned in concealed shirk what do we have to do what do we have to do to cleanse ourselves from the tons and tons of bags of pollution and contamination of concealed shirk that has permeated and infiltrated our very existence what do we have to do? give us a protocol this protocol is very important the Quran says إِنَّمَا mushrikun najas. the mushrikun, the mushrik is najis this isn't mushrik only in the open form of shirk it's the concealed shirk too why do we limit shirk of the Quran only to that we say whoever says this is God that's the open form of shirk polytheism shirk has concealed form every verse which is speaking of shirk when it's used especially in the absolute sense both have to be taken in mind we are spiritually najis too spiritually najis we have to now cleanse ourselves this cleansing requires a process and we still haven't opened up what does lahu mean what does la'ib mean and what is the relationship and how they must go for the concealed shirk to go and then true life be granted upon us inshallah we'll continue tomorrow I assume from what you said that we, we will open up this concept a little bit more about lahu wal lahab. Yes. Lahab wal lahu is it? Laib. Lahab. Laib. Wal laib. But I, I, the question came to my mind then why put us through this? Why would Allah put us through yes. this no. process? Yes, don't get me wrong. Even if you're dead, you'll be given your heaven. Don't worry about level one of heaven. But if you want higher degrees of heaven, Yes, that's difficult. Otherwise, Imam Sajjad salam, says, I'm surprised how anyone cannot go to heaven. I'm surprised. Yes. I'm not saying everyone will go to heaven. Yeah. Some people will go to hell and stay there. And they're more comfortable there. Yeah. And, uh, but yes, but for the higher levels, we're talking about the higher. Even the Quran is saying that most believers are mushrik. That doesn't mean most believers will go to hell. They're, they're all going to heaven. Yes. But everyone, in every month, two or three days, going in total isolation. Or once a year, coming to a place like this, but alone with the family or whatever. You know, away from everyone. For 30, 40 days, something like that, is very beneficial. But in, you can't do that in a group. Because when, when it's a group, you're going to socialize. You're going to have, you know, these tourist attractions and people are diverted to other things as well. And they'll divert you. It's something that you have to do alone. If you're single, it's better. If you're married and you can do it with the husband, it's of benefits. If not, anyway, even if you can do it alone, it has benefits. This is definite. But as a way of life, 
the constant, always being in isolation, leading a monastic life. In the Quran, it refers to some Christians who did that. And Allah had given the green light, but they still transgress the limits. So if we see it in certain civilizations where they live a monastic life, there is a degree of perfection in that. But Islam says, I want to offer you something which is more perfect. And that is not to choose this as a lifestyle, but two or three days every month is very good. And the Prophet used to do that. Um, once a year for a 30, 40 day period, it's very good. But on a day to day a level, um, you have to be with the people. And whilst with the people, you have to try and preserve yourself. But being with the people doesn't mean laughing and socializing and playing around with them. Occupying yourself with futile, void, dunya talk. This is poison. I'm not saying do that. But you have a job. When I say live with the people, you have a job. You get married. These certain responsibilities, you don't escape from them. Why? Because if you live a monastic life, we, we said this before, that our aim is to be Khalifatullah. We, that means we want to succeed Allah. Allah created us in His image, meaning that we manifest and have the potential to manifest Allah's attributes. If you lead a monastic life, how are you going to manifest Allah's patience, Allah's forgiveness? You know, you have to be with people to manifest patience. So Islam says monasticism partially can be framed in a particular manner, two or three days a month. But as a lifestyle, no, you have to get a job, you have to marry, you have to have children. All these things are, we'll speak more about this later, but even having children, marrying, it's not the child, it's not the spouse which is important here. It's getting closer to Allah, these are just means. But when I say be with the people, it's this kind of thing, but not gossiping and wasting your time with pathetic talk. That, you distance yourself from that. If you can guide them, guide them. If you can't and you're going to be misguided, forget it. But you have other responsibilities. It's not a responsibility to go and socialize and go out with your friends every night, every two nights once or every week. We don't have such a responsibility. Responsibilities, we work. And if we marry, we have children. If you're male, you have to work. If you're female, you have other responsibilities where you can manifest those attributes of Allah. But other things, you have to make sure you don't fall into sin. And therefore, solitude is good um, whilst being with the people. Well, that means always recalling Allah. And, um, and solitude is a private thing, especially at night time. Especially towards the one or two hours preceding Salatul Fajr, where one, you know, makes it in solitude with Allah alone, one to one, and not in congregation. That's not Shia Irfan. It's not wrong to do it in congregation sometimes. But when you look at Shia Irfan, Shia mysticism, this in spiritual experiences, you do it in solitude. The Mi'raj, you do it in solitude, and so on and so forth. Um, yes. So, I think. I yes, yes. Yes, so you mentioned earlier that Allah misguides those who um, want to, those who want to be misguided. Yes. And you say, um, 
you did something like let's say you did something wrong and then satanic forces come your way but then like if i'm not mistaken surah fatir says that um allah misguides those uh he wishes to misguide so doesn't this contradict why doesn't he just say he misguides just, those you've asked a question <laughs> and then you use the other translation see what the problem was there I'm saying the verse says, Allah misguides those who want it. That's the translation. And in Surah Fat it's this. Your question is saying, why, you're, you're telling me, why are you saying Allah misguides those who want it when Allah is saying Allah misguides those that He want to? You see what the problem is there? Do you understand? What? No, no. I'm saying that translation is wrong. Allah misguides those who want misguidance. In Allah yudhillu man yasha. This yasha has a pronoun in it. In Arabic syntax, the pronoun is reverted to the nearest entity, which is man, which is a relative noun. Not to Allah. Allah misguides those who want but the want goes back to those who want it not to Allah so that's that's the answer that's the translation but even if you wanted to translate it like that which many translators of the Quran translate it we can justify it in another way but I'm not sure if you're interested to know that other way but it can be justified or interpreted yes It's all cause and effect. Everything is cause and effect. Yes, yes. yes. But Hayatun uh, Tayyiba, I have heard a hadith uh, of uh, when someone asked him, Amali, what is the meaning? What is what does this verse mean? What does that Hayatun Tayyiba mean? Uh, and he said, Al Qanaa is uh, contentment. So, can you elaborate what he meant by contentment? Here, well, the signs that you've acquired through life, let's see, what are they? That's just one sign. It's not a route to acquiring it. But how can you tell someone is truly with this true life? Uh, it's contentment, true contentment, not a, you know, it's not a show or anything like that. But they're content with their sustenance. They work for something and they're earning okay, but now something happened. And they're earning less now as they used to. But they're still, everything is continuing, but they get disappointed. They're not content yet. These people are dead. They haven't really experienced anything spiritually. That's just one important sign, yes. Yes? I have a question. Uh, regarding the thing you said earlier about being dead, your Iman being dead, and because you said that your good deeds like when, when you uh, do your sadqa and everything, it's in order to get something back from Allah, right? It's, it's in order to get something in return from Allah. Uh, I didn't say, I, don't no. I didn't use that term. Uh, of course you didn't, I'm rephrasing yeah. that. So, yes, so what's the question? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm getting to it. So what you said was that do not use God as a means oh, to get things. as a means yes. to get something else, yes, yes. As a means yes. to get yes. things. Yes, yes. And, uh, Instead, just give sadqa in the name of Allah at times. Do it for Allah's sake. Yes, yes. for Allah's yes. sake. In order to get to a higher level in Jannah. No, no, no. No, Jannah doesn't matter anymore. Okay. You're doing it for Allah's but sake. But like in terms of uh, prayers, like namaz, yeah. we, we do it because it's wajib. Yes. So like most of the times, it's not like in our heart, we have the intention that we're doing it 
because we love Allah, most of the times we just end up doing because it's wajib, right? Right, right. So that's okay. how, how do we like... That's okay. We're still in the dead phase yet. Right. That's okay though. It's how do we get to the late? Yeah, that's the phase. whole discussion. We're going, we're going through right. today, tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. I'm going step by step. Right. So, inshallah. Right. Yeah. So far, we know that we have to get rid of concealed shirk. That's so far. But how? So far, we know that lahu and laib is a hindrance. Now, what do we have to do? What's the protocol? Tomorrow morning, we'll start with this, inshallah. Yes? No one can safely assert that he doesn't have any kind of shirk. Even no one can say for himself. Uh, what, is, what do you mean? Like yeah. No one, as a person, no one can say for himself right, that? that he doesn't have concealed shirk. Oh, so everyone has shirk? Yeah. Everyone, um, most people have it, the Quran says, yes. What about the Ahlul Bayt then? You know, the Quran says most believers. So those who have Iman level one, yes, most of them are still mushrik. You know, the Ahlul Bayt, they, they will Iman. Level four, <laughs> they were maximum. But can they say for themselves that we have no concealed shirk? Yeah. They, they don't say it, but they can because mm. they have no ego. Their words are Allah's mm. words, their actions are Allah's actions, their self will is annihilated in Allah's self will. When they say, I am the qalam, I am the kursi, I am the pen, I am the chair, I am, they're manifesting Allah's grandeur here. I think, uh, Sheikh, about this uh, means doing for Allah's sake, not to use Allah as a means. As a means, yes. You will have to uh, open up a bit. Uh, no, I, I don't because have anything extra to say. So, oh, for example, examples, you mean? Yeah, for exa right. yeah, examples. All right. If you can give. Yes. So, for example, I give. Let's say if I. You. I, I come to give a speech to you. I'm giving a speech. Did I do it for Allah's sake or not? Let's say you gave me no hediye after the speech and you didn't even say thank you and I went away. If I get disappointed that you gave me nothing, it means I didn't do it for Allah's sake. If you do it for Allah's sake, whether you give me a present or not, I do it for Allah's sake. He knows. This true life I'm only getting from him, not two dollars. Or, I, inv I invited you to my house for dinner. And then the next week you had an invitation, you invited friends, but you didn't invite me. And I got disappointed. Look, Why did I get disappointed? Because when I invited you to my house, I didn't do it for Allah's sake, pardon? You expected something in return. Yes, yes. I didn't do it for Allah's sake. Because irrespective of whether you invite me or not, Allah knows. Look how deficient our Tawheed is, everything. Then charity. I gave the example of charity. Then reading the Quran. Ziyarat Ashura. We see if we're Honest to ourselves, it's a very bleak picture. And we're, co we're continuing from this, inshallah, from tomorrow morning after Salatul Fajr, I think. We'll, we'll continue with this. And then we'll give a protocol. What, so, what do we do? Yes. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Is it safe to say what you're trying to say is that unconditional. When, you, when yes, you're saying this, yes. is we, what we're saying is unconditional. Yes, it's for Allah's sake, period. Yes. And, uh, not that because Nothing. of this yes, and yes, that. Yes, okay. Yes. And uh, Sheikh, I have. Uh, and Dwayne Komail has this. And you see this unconditional love of Amir al Mu'mineen. He said, even if I'm in hell, hell, if you put in hell, my problem is, but am I going to be cut off from calling you? Because that I can't bear. It's a theoretical thing, but yes, sorry. Uh, my question actually is, I'm a little confused about uh, a, co a com comment ca that came from a brother uh, saying that there is a difference between being dead in the Akhira and Jannah. You said there's two different, you're, you're talking about the, being them being two different things. Being dead in Akhira and in Jannah? You said uh, now we're not talking about Jannah in, anymore, we're talking about... No, the brother said that we're doing Salat to get Jannah. I'm saying on a high level, someone who does things for Allah's sake, when they do Salat, 
they're not looking for the Jannah. Okay? Whether you give them Jannah or not, that's not the issue, that's not their objective. It was for Allah's sake. Even if you don't give them Jannah, they won't be disappointed. The fact that we do it for Jannah, and we will get disappointed, as Imam Khomeini said, let's say if you were guaranteed, he, he said this in a speech, that if you were guaranteed that you're going to heaven, let's say you were given that guarantee from Allah, you would go to heaven. Hardly anyone would do Salat anymore. Why? Because when they do Salat, they're not doing it for Allah's sake. They're doing it for something, heaven, which is okay. And we'll continue from this. Yes, yes. So like level one, level one Iman, you would say, for example, you'd get like, you'd be at the stage of like a stable in Jannah or something. But level one Iman also says that what you're do still What do you mean by there. stable? Like, uh, you know, the, you said levels in Jannah, yes. for example. Yes, no, but stable, which, which you meant, you know, you stability you mean? No, no, like the, the horse stable. Yes, like well the, yes. the horse stable. Yes, kind yes, of yes, yes, yes. So, but it also says level one Iman is still not enough to be alive. It's enough for heaven. Level it's enough for heaven, but yes. not enough to be alive. In yeah, true life. Uh, no, okay. no. So that's what my confusion is. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. But uh, what are some of the books that you can recommend for us to improve or strengthen one's Tawheed? For Tawheed, you have to have a book list and you start off with just reading academic, academically Tawheed. So for example, Sayyid Mujtabu Musavi Lari, the Pardon? Yes, it's called Islamic lesson. No, uh, let less. No, no, no that's that's what that's the volumes. The first volume is God and His attributes. It's on Tawheed. That's a good place to start. Then Allah Tabo Taboi. In his Shia in Islam, you read the Tawheed of that. He has another book, Basic Teachings of Islam. You read only the Tawheed of that. You see. Then there are other books. You have a book list. If you do it under the auspices of a scholar, you'll benefit much more. If you do it alone, it's still going to be difficult, but it's better than nothing. So this has, this has level one, academic, learning it academically. When it comes to incorporating it, now we enter the realm of spiritual wayfaring. We have good books. We have good books. The thing is, without a mentor, it's going to be deficient. For example, Sayyid Mahdi Bahrul Ulum has a treatise, Treatise in Spiritual Wayfaring, a very good book. And it's translated into English. And the English isn't bad. It's in alislam.org or com. Org, yes. Um, but if you read it, it's very difficult. I don't, I mean, without a mentor. But there are simpler books like Ibrahim Amini's Self Building, which I think it's in, translated into Swahili too. It's, I think so, yes. The same one who wrote the book on marriage. Yeah. The, yes. It's called Self Building. You can find it on. Um, yes, yeah, so yeah, you need a kind of a program. You know, spirituality, it's a process. And this program has to be persistent in this program. And not just, you know, for one week you read hours and hours and then you forget it. For example, over 10 or 20 weeks, you have a constant program under the auspice of a scholar in Tawheed, practical Tawheed, theoretical Tawheed, or in Akhlaq and spiritual wayfaring, and so on and so forth. This, today, would be the best thing. Yes. Six. Yes, Samakha. Uh, in regards to mother's, uh, I don't know if it's an analogy or what exactly it was, he said that you have reached, if I'm not uh, making a mistake, you've reached a stable place in general. 
No, no, actually, that's why I was asking, what do you mean by stable? He didn't mean a stable place. He meant the animal stable. That's what he meant. Do you know, yes. Do you know animals, the animalistic pleasures? People in this dunya, they may be believers, but all they want in the hereafter are the animalistic. They, had, they wanted it here, but they didn't because of Islam, they control themselves or whatever. But that's what they want. And, and they'll be given that. And that's okay, that's level one of heaven. We can't all, and that's good, it's not a bad thing. But heaven has degrees though. I mean, sometimes you may be sitting with Amir al Mu'mineen. Look what a heaven that would be. Yes. And sometimes you want the pleasures, eating, that kind of thing. Sorry, that is why it's called the stable. Yet, this scholar in Qom, he very prominent scholar, I don't want to mention it. He called many people in that dead phase, who were believers though, they'll, ge they'll get their heaven. He said, don't worry, you'll get your heaven. They'll take you to your animal stable. Yes. So, we have to do a bit more, you know, to make an effort. That's the issue. Okay. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ala